The Battle of Graveney Marsh, September 27, 1940. A lonely Junkers Ju-88 bomber limps across the Kent countryside. Flown by Unteroffizier Fritz Ruland, the crew are returning to their base in occupied France following a bombing raid over the city of London. Anti-aircraft fire over the capital has shot out one of the Ju-88's two engines, and the loss of power has caused the aircraft to fall behind the rest of the formation. Unfortunately for the crew, British radar stations have been tracking the Ju-88, and fighter controllers are vectoring Spitfires from 66 and 92 squadrons towards the wounded German bomber. Arriving on the scene, the Spitfire pilots discover that the Ju-88 is the brand new A1 model. The RAF were keen to capture any new aircraft and had issued orders to their pilots to force these aircraft to land rather than destroy them so they could be examined by intelligence officers. At the controls of the Ju-88, Ruland is frustrated. His bomber is fast, manoeuvrable and well armed. Under normal circumstances he'd be able to mount a strong defence against the Spitfires, but with one engine shot out he's struggling to even maintain altitude. Brulant takes the only defensive action he can. Dropping the bomber down to low level will make the attack more difficult for the Spitfires. It will also force them to attack from above, where Richter's twin 7.92mm machine guns can offer some defence. Despite their best efforts, the Ju-88 is a sitting duck, and the Spitfires begin their attack. Richter mounts the best defence he can, but the wounded bomber is no match for the two Spitfires on their tail. Bullets slam into the German bomber, shattering the windscreen and throwing broken shards of glass into Richter's eyes. Together, Spitfire pilot Sergeant Claude Arthur Parsons and Sergeant Hugh Bowen Morris shoot out the bomber's last remaining engine. Powerless, Ruland's aircraft begins to glide towards the ground. With the crew already too low to bail out, they're left with no choice but to prepare for a crash landing. On the ground is Captain John Cantifer, the commanding officer of A Company, 1st Battalion London Irish Rifles. Cantifer is on his way to inspect one of his platoons in the small village of Graveney. He watches with interest as the powerless Ju-88 glides past him, but Cantifer doesn't find the presence of the German aircraft concerning. In the summer of 1940, the Kent countryside was littered with crashed aircraft and parachuting airmen were an almost daily occurrence but in almost every case the crew were captured immediately. In fact, the events were usually very civilised. Just a few weeks earlier, a German airman had parachuted into a field where he was immediately apprehended by the military. The German was taken to the local army base by motorbike, very kindly holding his guard's rifle on his back. Captain Cantifer arrives in the small village of Graveney, where his platoon were billeted at the local pub. He's met by platoon sergeant Allworth, who explains that men have already been sent to the crash site. At that moment, the sound of gunfire rips through the air. Seeing the rows of Lee Enfield rifles lined up ready for inspection, Cantifer asks if the men took weapons. No sir, the inspection sir, came the reply. A few miles away on Graveney Marsh, Fritz Ruland had successfully crash-landed his Junkers Ju-88. In fact, Ruland had made such a good job of the landing that both the crew and the aircraft had survived mostly intact, and that caused a problem. The RAF pilots had been correct in their assessment that this was a new Ju-88. Just two weeks old, Ruland's bomber was fitted with the top-secret BZA targeting computer. This system was designed for dive bombers and allowed the crew to enter parameters such as wind speed and target altitude. It would then continuously monitor the bomber's dive angle to calculate the optimum moment to release the bombs. The system was so secret that that very month the Luftwaffe had issued D Luft 4601, a 12-page document ordering the destruction of secret equipment should an aircraft crash land in enemy territory. To do this, the crew had been issued with a spring busher or explosive box, a metal box containing one kilo of TNT attached to a three-minute fuse. It should take Ruland no more than just a few minutes to prepare the box and arm the fuse. Captain Cantifer and Sergeant Allworth arrive at the scene where they meet up with Lieutenant Yardsley and his platoon of ten riflemen. Watching through Yardsley's binoculars, the officers survey the scene and Cantifer decides on his plan. Sergeant Allworth and five riflemen would hold their current position to provide covering fire. At the same time, Lieutenant Yardsley would take the remaining five riflemen and work their way through the ditches to a forward flanking position just 50 yards from the crashed bomber. 
Cantifer himself would oversee the entire operation. On Cantifer's command, Sergeant Ulworth and his men open fire with their Leenfield rifles. Simultaneously, Yardsley leads his men through the ditches on their flanking mission. The Germans have recovered two of the bomber's 7.92mm machine guns and use them to return fire. They have almost seven times as much ammunition as the British soldiers, but it's the British that have the tactical advantage. The British soldiers are spread out and well covered, but the Germans are taking fire on two sides with nothing but the thin metal of the aircraft for protection. It takes just a few minutes for the Luftwaffe men to realise the futile nature of their fight and raise the white flag. A preliminary search of the Germans revealed nothing of concern. Helpfully though, one of Cantifer's men spoke German and overheard the crew discussing an explosive charge on the aircraft. This was known to be a common joke amongst downed Luftwaffe airmen, but Cantifer took no chances and immediately ordered his men to clear the area. He then entered the German bomber himself to search for the explosives. He discovers a dark metal box, but unable to open or disarm the device, he decides to throw it clear of the aircraft and launches the box into a drainage ditch. Despite the events, the incident ended in the most civilised of ways. Captain Cantifer and his men escorted the German crew back to the pub in Graveney. There, the men of the London Irish Rifles bought their prisoners beer, whilst the Germans repaid the kindness with metal pilot's wings and other souvenirs. And so goes the legend of the Battle of Graveney Marsh. But declassified documents suggest an interesting and alternative ending to the story. The official RAF report states there is no evidence the German crew fired their weapons at anything other than their own aircraft. This raises the obvious question, if the Germans had the Springbusher self-destruction box, why would they need to shoot at their own aircraft to destroy it? The RAF report also makes no mention of any explosives being found at the scene. The metal box found by Captain Cantifer does however match the description of the top secret BZA targeting computer. Is it possible then that the Germans never had an explosive box and were in fact attempting to destroy the aircraft with their sidearms? And if that was the case, what did Captain Cantifer find on the aircraft? If it wasn't an explosive box, was it the top secret and highly fragile BZA targeting computer that got thrown into a drainage ditch? Perhaps we'll never know. But without doubt, Captain John Cantifer was acting to protect both the aircraft and his men. For his unquestionable bravery, he was awarded the George Medal. The incident was nicknamed the Battle of Graveney Marsh, and with the exception of terrorist events, it remains to this day the last time that enemy forces fired their weapons on British soil. If you enjoyed the story of the Battle of Graveney Marsh, please do help the channel out by hitting the thumbs up button and make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so you can find your way back for more animated war stories.